So you've been in the Bahamas and free diving for the last few weeks. What have you been exploring and discovering? What's been sort of characteristic of this trip? In a way, going through, through a mild version of solitude to really to really experience myself free from other people for a bit. Even though I was with people, it felt very much outside of my regular scenario. So um, this allowed me to sort of drop into myself in a new way. And I felt, about a month ago, I felt that that's what I wanted. So I booked a trip to the Bahamas and um, sort of as a symbol and because it's one of my passions now, I signed up for this um, free diving course. So you said this solitude you said you've kind of gotten what you you've dropped into yourself more than you more than before you sort of had like a more of an experience than otherwise than you otherwise would yeah it's funny like even with free diving for example there is it is essentially um, a very individual sport or sport activity and because there's this threshold in you go through of just being down there by yourself and making the commitment to go as deep as you have set yourself to go. And there is, it's, it's almost like going through the eye of the needle. Like there's nothing, there's nothing you can do outside of just being there in that moment because um, it, it's basically like squeezing, squeezing a Vipassana retreat, you know, where you sit and you observe your thoughts and your emotions, but you don't react to them. And, and when you're doing, when you're doing a retreat like that, usually it takes like a few days to drop into that state. But with free diving, you sort of need to instantly go to that place because there's no other option. Like you cannot, you cannot panic. You cannot, um, you cannot have all these thoughts about everything outside of the water. So when you make the commitment to go deep and to sort of be at the edge of your physical capacity and mental capacity, then you really just you're just doing that thing. You're doing that one thing. So it's been, it's been, um, it's been very cool for me to see the effect that that has on my psychology, um, because I've been doing it for five days straight now, uh, pretty intensely, and going deeper every day. And it does it does really alter your your state of mind, so to speak. Because normally I'm like I'm very focused, but. Normally there is more, there's way more thought, there's way more activity going on. Whereas this week I've really felt and I've allowed myself to really take this time for myself to, to go through that eye of the needle and really separate everything unnecessary from my present experience. So I find myself as a result after my dives and now too, uh, at the end of this course, I find myself very automatically focused and like I've sifted through even more like nonsense versus just pure truthful authentic being here now so it's very obvious to me to just be here now and it's very obvious to me what just sort of feels like irrelevant and redundant whereas when there's a lot going on and when I'm activated in a lot of ways and I'm engaged in a lot of ways um, there's less of a uh, there's less of a radar for that. The, the radar is always there, but there's less of a a standard. I'd say like now the standard is sort of like nothing nothing fits through the eye of the needle, you know, except for the eye of the needle itself, like the moment itself. It's sort of been an analogy for allowing myself to sift through and let go of um, of the social stuff that happens around me all the time and go through that eye of the needle or go through that black hole, so to speak, dive deeper, let go and leave everything behind. And because that's what you have to do and then come back up refreshed in a way. That's like remarkably symbolic. It's like perfectly exactly, symbolic, right? it seems yeah. like. So would you have called this like a valley experience where you're sort of like going more into the like enlightenment path in a way you're sort of like opening up more? Um, no, I would say I've been going more into the enlightenment aspect of my self-realization. Um, but no, it's, it's not been due to a valley experience. I didn't feel lower than normal. Or I didn't feel like I was slower or integrating things at a slower pace than usual. Um, 
So it wasn't a valley experience, I'd say. It was just, it came out of passion. It was just time for, it was time for sort of shedding some skin in a way. Oh, that's interesting. So you can have a peak experience that is also an enlightenment experience. Oh, absolutely. Experience. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't know yeah, but usually I just recommend if people are going through a vibrational valley experience to not beat themselves up about that, that and to not like try to manifest the house of their dreams, but to instead sort of go into the enlightenment self-realization aspect of it because it allows you to sort of shed that skin and crawl out of your skin even larger like a snake would, you know, when they, they shed skin so they can grow. Um, so yeah, the butterfly crawling out of its cocoon, I feel that if we, if we keep focusing on the empowerment teachings too much, when things are meant to sort of be not necessarily a lower frequency, but more long wave frequency, it's very tempting to start judging ourselves and to make that into a problem. And then we get all chaotic and hectic. But if we simply allow that valley experience to drop us more into ourselves and to dive deeper instead and to not need or want anything from the world for that period of time, but just to find the satisfaction and the peace completely within without even activating too many things or dreams or visualizations or activities, just allowing ourselves to dive deeper, to become purer, you know, to become more one with that truth that is here. Cool. So how would you parallel the sort of phases of consciousness or the stages of awareness or I don't know how you would call that with diving sort of are there is there like the while you're preparing phase kind of matches up with part of so the preparation phase is all about completely relaxing the body and the mind and basically basically resting in the intention that you've already set, which is, okay, I'm going to go to this depth. Now, of course, you can always turn around if you have to, um, although that sort of disturbs the flow a little bit. So it's good when you set a depth and they set the platform on a line at a certain depth, um, it's good to actually go for that depth, unless you have equalization problems or the pressure becomes too much. But so during the preparation phase, I'm just resting in the intention that I already have, which is, oh, I'm going to go to whatever, 30 meters, 30. Today I went to 36, which was a personal best. Um, so it didn't, I didn't feel intimidated at all. It felt like totally comfortable, like I can totally do this. Um, I wanted to go for 40, but um, my teacher said, or my instructor said that you need to really build this up because the body needs to get used to these new levels of pressure, otherwise you can get injured. So. So we went for 36 meters and um, that intention is set. So I rest in that intention. Then I relax my body and I can feel my psyche shift into sort of more of a dream state, like a, a sleepy state where you're like before you're falling asleep, where you feel yourself sort of uh, the worries of everyday life. Not that I have a lot of worries everyday life, but the activity of everyday life subsides just leaves you and with practice like these five days of intense practice and of course with my history already in 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 the science of of consciousness and and dealing with the mind and meditation and letting go of the personality it's fairly easy for me so I just drop into that relaxation and usually um, the last few dives I've started giving myself a blissful little smile before I go just like ah look up at the sky and see the clouds and be in that peaceful state and just smile, feel really good before I go down. Instead of thinking about going down into the darkness, I just really like allow myself to have this short little wave of happiness. Um, now you can't be smiling all the time because water would be entering your mask. So you gotta like let go of even that, but just the moment of like a breeze of bliss, you know? Oh. <laughs> and then I take one more breath, like, I relax even more and I get ready. I equalize, I start going down. And then at that point, there's nothing, there's nothing else that I'm focused on except just doing that thing. Like, and I'm, I'm seeing the line cause I'm using the line as a marker. So I don't go in a, in a wrong direction or hit my head on like the side of the blue hole or something. So we, we go down nicely in a straight line. And then, yeah, at some point, like after, after 18 to 20 meters, I just start free falling because the lungs are compressed. So they're like a, a third of their normal size and the body becomes negatively buoyant. So it's sort of a threshold you pass through at 20 meters. 15 to 20 meters feels kind of uncomfortable because 
your body is going through so many different processes at the same time in a short amount of time like it's it, it it's has to switch and it switches on even more of the what's called the mammalian dive reflex so but past those 20 meters and you start free falling it's really you can feel the pressure building and it becomes a little harder to equalize but it's just so nice like you're just flying basically just falling into the darkness falling asleep and then the line is very reassuring to the mind because you're trained to look at the rope and then you start to see the tape which is pasted like two meters above the plate so you know oh, okay i can extend my hand now and then you hit the you know you hit the little ball and you allow yourself to turn around and then you go back up um, and so that's when usually the contractions start or when the urge to breathe starts, when you go back up, at least for me. Um, so then it's just a matter of knowing that at that point too, like you're not going to panic because if you're gonna go panic, what are you gonna do? You're at 30 meters and it, it's gonna take you at least 30 seconds to get to the surface. So you have to relax. Like we also do pool training, but actually don't like it as much because I don't have to, like there is no, there is no ultimatum. Right. But when you go deep down, like you have made that commitment and there's no other way. So like I said, again, it's this it's this shortcut to it's, it's like an entire Vipassana retreat um, squeezed into two minutes of diving. So what? Well, so then I come up and I see my safety diver and it's all fine. He meets me halfway. And um, so then near the end, the urge to breathe becomes more intense because I'm kicking up because of the negative buoyancy at 30 or plus meters. You need to kick up a little harder and you notice that. So you're using a little bit more oxygen, building more of the carbon dioxide, which causes the urge to breathe, which then can cause the mind to sort of like panic because it's intense. But that's what they train you for, to allow these discomfort, this, these uncomfortable sensations to take over the body, but you remain unaffected. So again, it's a real parallel with uh, Vipassana or mindfulness or awareness of emotional reactions but not actually reacting so one thing that i noticed when i when i came out of these dives and uh like i was i was back hang, hanging out with you guys socially like i felt way less social than i normally do because you just it like it it purifies you in a way even more so there's no you're not thinking past any moment but now you know and i'm used to activating my imagineering capacities quite a bit like not think about the future but imagine and and create and like be engaged with different projects and and be communicating with different people at the same time but um again this whole retreat or training free dive training which sort of was a retreat for myself quite naturally coming out of the water i felt very focused just very single pointed the mind the body were very present i felt very good um and not very social and one, one question that keep coming, kept coming up, which I'm not sure made a lot of sense to you guys, but it made a lot of sense to me, is, uh, you know, if, if people were bickering or even just joking around or like complaining about something, even if it was a joke, the sentence came up in me and I said it a couple of times, like, would you worry about this if you were 100 feet under the water? Um, and which is totally true, because if you are 100 feet under the water, you're not going to do anything, like nothing. And it's such a cleanser, it's such a purifier. So it's actually a really good question, perhaps more so for those that have experience in freediving because they understand what that means experientially. But you can tune into that even if you're not a freediver and really ask yourself that question. If I was 30 meters underneath the surface of the water right now on a single breath and I had to go up and it would take me at least 30 seconds, would I be thinking this? Would I be worrying about this? Would I be thinking about the future? Would I be concerned with this? Would I use my body or my energy in this way? Again, it's such a purifier. It just it, it forces you to get rid of everything that does not belong, everything that's redundant. Okay, so yesterday I asked you if you were going to set the world record, and you said, not unless I cheat. <laughs> <laughs> not unless I use superpowers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for freediving, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what are you saying? <laughs> What do you mean? How could you? So, are you gonna set the world record? I don't think so. No, it's. I'm. I'm just doing this. Uh, I might set a national record for Holland at some point. I don't know. It depends. I. I don't know what excites me, in which moment down the line. You know. So it's all. 
it's all about what feels the best to me now. Like I've been really into climbing for the last three years and I feel that in the last half a year, that's been much less, for example. I still really enjoy it, but a lot of the purpose has been extracted, you know, a lot of what it gave to me and how it adds to who I am as a, as a person um, has been extracted. So now it's just like a really entertaining activity and I still enjoy it, but the drive for it is not as much, it's not as strong. Same probably for freediving because I just tend to not stick to one thing. It's very boring to me. So I'd love to develop more skills and like become better at it, just physically becoming able to do deeper dives and more comfortable dives and longer breath holds. Um, for now, that still excites me. There's still something in that for me as a, as a human being almost, as a, well, as a consciousness, but as a, as a being that's developing itself also on a human level. Um, there's something about that that really still fascinates me and it still feels like it has this edge of mystery and an enlightenment to it and expansion. So when that drops away, I'll probably move on to something else that has a bit of this like sense of uh, the impossible in a way, like this sense of, that's what I liked about climbing too actually. What got me into climbing is the idea of free solo climbing, which is without ropes. Um, which I, I did much more in the beginning than like now I don't really do that anymore because that ha the benefit out of that has been extracted. So uh, when I was very inexperienced in climbing, I would actually go and climb without ropes, which is a little stupid, but um, it, only when it felt good, when it felt intuitively like, yeah, I got to do this. So same with, same with free diving, you know, there's that sense of the ultimatum and um, it doesn't feel at all like an adrenaline junkie kind of experience. It just feels really like it suits my personality. Like that's what I'm striving for. And I know, I know that I'm totally safe and I know that I won't die unless I really totally want to. So I always feel safe in these kinds of uh, new activities or expansions. Do you, can you tune into what, what might be next? Um, well, not so much in terms of the more earthly stuff, like what will I be doing as, as a passion, as a hobby. I think free diving I will continue to do for a while, if not forever to some extent, but passionately for a while. Um, but I'm not sure what's next, except um, developing my superpowers at some point when I feel like it is relevant to start doing this and it starts exciting me again. Um, that's what I will start to get into. So what do you mean by superpowers? Um, I mean like really dropping into, giving myself the opportunity to fully drop into the fact that I am consciousness creating this reality, that I am a non-physical consciousness and that all of this is just a dream and a projection. When I do that too much, when I fall into that too much at present or up to this point, it feels, it, it, I reach a point where I feel like, oh, okay, things are happening, like anything is possible now. Um, but then it starts to feel bad, like something about it is, is forcing me to not go there yet. Um, because it's not relevant yet, it would distract me from my theme or purpose, it wouldn't be relevant for the people that I'm here to serve yet. So when the collective catches up with these basic understandings and suddenly magic or mystery or, or um, or miracles no longer are seen as this weird thing, but they're actually understood as an everyday life experience. And then we can start to push the boundaries with that. We can really start to cross some lines and, and, and push what's possible in people's minds. But if that were to happen now, that would simply mess with people's understanding of reality to such an extent to where it would distract them from the level of limitation they've placed upon their consciousness in order to learn certain lessons that you cannot learn without that limitation or illusion in place. So, but I do feel that eventually, at some point, somewhat sooner than later, um, that's going to shift and I will be allowed to go more into that, more fully and explore um, what is possible, what I can actually do in that way and then start teaching that eventually as well. So like what comes to mind is stuff that you feel like you're almost on the edge of being able to do, but like what feels like specifics? Right, it's actually it's hard to answer that because what I feel that I'm, I'm right at the edge of what I'm able to do, it all depends on the state that I shift into. 
So right now, just talking to you, having just done a free diving course and just being really grounded here, I don't feel any of that right now, like other than just my regular intuition and clairvoyance and ability to be really aware and clear and notice what's going on around myself, around my, um, in my environment energetically. But when it comes to actual physically evidential superpowers, um, it's not at all on my mind or radar right now. It's not at all a focus. But I could right now, the second, if it were to be relevant, I could shift into a state where that suddenly becomes very relevant and then it's right there. So because I've had these experiences before, so it's almost like you're shifting back and forth more between being sort of non-physical or non-human and being more human and being totally cool with that because that's part of what you're exploring. And the lessons you're learning is more important than the abilities that you have or display. So I'm totally cool with with resting or being in a state of illusion to an extent to where I know more is possible, but it's not even really on my mind because who cares, you know? Like I've accepted the human theme, I've accepted this, this journey, this life and what's important. However, it's always on the verge of happening, meaning like it's always available if it needs to be available. So I don't feel far off from that at all. I just feel when it's relevant, these things will happen. And so yeah, I'm talking about teleportation and levitation um, as one of the most, some of the most popular, well-known superpowers cool. out there. Um, yeah. Can you be invisible? Sure. Why not? Just yeah. sneak up on you. <laughs> <laughs> so your present theme is to have planet Earth reach enlightenment by 2035, right? A globally enlightened civilization by 2035. How is free diving relevant? What's the, what's the correlation? Hmm. Well, first of all, it's relevant because it really excites me. So it's always relevant for the bigger picture somehow, even if we can't connect the dots yet. Um, but it's relevant because of the effect that it has on me as a person, as a consciousness. Um, again, like on every day, in my everyday life, I'm rather active on many levels. And so it's really good for me to stay grounded in a certain way and to to purify or cleanse myself of all these vibrations that I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I, I have a very high um, endurance for that. Like I, I can go like half a year being really engaged with things before I feel like I really need like a couple of days of, or sometimes it's just half a day or sometimes it's a couple of weeks, whatever, but of really going through not being engaged with any of that and just experiencing myself again, free from others. So, that's how it's serving me. And then from that, it will naturally spill out into the work that I do effortlessly. So, and it keeps, me, it keeps me grounded and pure in a way to where the vision remains, um, remains a very probable reality. If I, if I go off too much on one tangent and, and are not brought back to, to the whole picture or to who I am again and again, um, then you know, it's easy to get, lose sight of what's most relevant for your theme. So. So that made me think, so now that you've been here, now that you've had this experience, how do you feel about your company and your group back home and everything that's going on, all your activities that you've been engaged in? How are you thinking about that stuff? I feel great about it. It's just that I'm not really thinking about it. <laughs> it's like, it's like on the horizon. And it doesn't mean that I'm not as passionate about it. It's just that none of the timelines are running through my head right now, you know? It's just, yeah, it's there and it's taking care of itself. And actually, actually this freediving course so far has added to my ability to, not ability, but added to m me reminding myself or dropping into that state of surrender even more where I'm, I'm less personally involved in any of the outcomes. So it's like, yeah, no, it will happen. It has happened. It's it's happening, it's set already. So I'm just allowing it to happen even more so than before. So, so any sort of personal strain that I place upon myself or sense of responsibility um, has now been lessened even more, you know? Cool, sweet. It's very interesting to do this with a buddy. Free diving requires a buddy, basically. Their slogan is never free dive alone because you know you can have blackouts and if no one's there to pull you to the service, then um, you're toast. So it's a very important principle, even though it's a highly individual sport, it's completely individual. It's also reliant on 
uh, the body system, so to speak. So I've been doing this course with, uh, with Max. And we once went to Joshua Tree and we camped out somewhere in the middle of the desert there. Um, and afterwards, we felt altered, like we couldn't really relate to the people around us anymore. This was only one night there. It's just going through a certain kind of experience and then being in that focused zone where, where everything suddenly seems irrelevant and, and redundant and sort of, uh, what's the word, frivolous? Like not really, not really having any substance whatsoever, especially socially. So interacting with other people, we felt super weird. And actually after a day of free diving and going somewhat deep, um, I noticed like we feel the same way like we're just totally turned into the present moment and we're sort of like the personality that we have is super light and it's just like here and there it makes this nonsensical funny comment but it's all held in this lightness of the present moment and there's no concern of future or past um, or, or and no real desire or urge to like talk about what we're going to do next or so we're just very like mellow but heightened and um yeah, it's cool. It's cool to experience that with someone and then notice the difference between us two and other people um, when we're in that state. And it's just all interesting observation. And it's all temporary anyway. But. So yeah, just like I said about climbing where I enter sort of a state of micro-focus, it's very similar to um, that when I, when I free dive. Like actually the more I'm focused on the tiniest particles that I can witness and observe, the more dropped in and relaxed and beyond the body I feel, which is really sort of very helpful on saving oxygen and not panicking or freaking out or having the mind have its way with adrenaline. So like I noticed the, just going down, I noticed the texture of the rope and I noticed myself like free falling and the rope passing me by. Um, and I see like the little particles lit up by the water, by the light that's pouring through the water, shining through the water. So, yeah, the microfocus is exactly the same thing there. It's even more so in free diving, I think, even more crucial to develop that microfocus. Because um, climbing, you can sort of keep a gross focus and do your thing. But in free diving, you have, you have to just drop in like that. It's kind of, it is, it does feel accessible even without doing it. It feels like nice. I can kind of see what you're talking about. Nice. How would you guide somebody into that using free diving kind of as a but without them actually free diving? Right. Cool. Well, the shortest, the shortest guided meditation would be like, what would you be doing right now if you were 100 <laughs> feet down? <laughs> what would you think of? What would you feel? And then initially, maybe your response would be, if you haven't experienced what that's like, your initial response might be, well, I would freak the fuck out. But actually, if you think about it, if you know that you have to forget about everything, you have to, like not think about anything. And the contractions or panic that your body feels, you have to basically say that it's no big deal. Like you have to, so in order to get back up. So if, if you care about your life in that sense, in that analogy, in that metaphor, then what would you actually do at 100 feet down? If you, if you imagine it. I'm not I sure if this works anything. for you as yeah, a non-free totally diver. Does. But like you have to, right? So like, oh, I have so to not think. This like I have, have to, to doesn't really work in other things. Like you can't hypothetical, it can't be hypothetical. And you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, that's true. But well, in this case it can, with free diving it can, I can. But like when you're otherwise in your teachings, when you're telling somebody to like do something, like you've got to just get over it or you've got to just move on from this. You've got to just, Yeah. it's, there's no ultimatum. I see what you mean. Like there's yeah, yeah. no, people <laughs> it's just, just theoretical. Don't, yeah. It doesn't have that ultimatum so it works to actually have to do something life or death to have to do something it'll work it works <laughs> well i think that's why many people seek it out you know and that's i guess what they call adrenaline junkies in a way uh, yeah. it's like people seek that state of oneness of single-mindedness of no concern but they don't know how to access it without the activity luckily i do so i don't get addicted to these things um, but it's still fun to experience it because it happens at a different level and in a different way it just works on your psychology in quite a different way. So, but anyone can access that state of single-mindedness, but we don't put that amount of ultimatum on ourselves as opposed to when we're climbing without ropes and we will die if we fall. Um, or we go free diving and we will die if we don't, you know, relax. So we're, 
it's sort of an extreme, again, shortcut way to access that state, but you can always access it. So what you do, right? You do actually put that level of ultimatum on yourself. It's like when you talk about being really precise and really you mean when priority. I'm not doing any of these yeah. physical activities yeah correct I'd say most of the time I do because and and this is that's a really good question actually or comment this is what I've developed for myself over time is like one of my core teachings is prioritize like if you can't prioritize what's truly important to you I don't have to teach you 90% of the things I teach you it's all about having your priorities straight and it sounds sort of like, you know, okay, do your laundry. And I, I, I really, really mean like bigger picture stuff, like, like who are you? And in this moment, how does that apply? Because we get so random, so distracted so easily and so caught up in other people's energies and the automatic collective mind that we're part of that we don't realize that we're a physical expression of a non-physical consciousness that's here on planet Earth in this transformational age that has a purpose and a theme and an excitement to follow and expand upon and to develop oneself and to, to be as authentic as one can be. I've learned to, to experience great dissatisfaction when I'm not focused in that way for too long or for even not so long. But if you, if you can sharpen that motivation, that intrinsic ultimatum of like, what have I done today? Like, and not to judge yourself, like, oh, I haven't done anything today, but to, judge your, to not judge yourself, but to simply ask yourself that question very lovingly as a sifting through, as a purification process that then follows. Because you ask yourself, what have I done today? Like, have I been myself? So it's so easy for us to get lost in, in, in nonsense, like in everyday trivial activities and in what's already set in place for us, you know, like Steve Jobs sort of said, like we look around, but we don't really realize that everything we see is put in place by people no smarter than us. Then, I mean, I don't mean this judgmentally, but in a way, like we, we tend to go with the quote unquote flow that's already set for us, the tone. We start vibrating at the tone that's already the what I would call the unconscious collective mind. When we're not prioritizing what's truly important and who we really are, then that means that our vibration is up for anything. You know, if we don't have a direction, if we don't know which way we want to go, then each wind, every, every, every um, direction that the wind goes in can take us wherever we want, if we're sailing, for example. So we need to have that direction. If we don't have that direction, then any, any influence we are available to, we are open to, and it's so easy to be lazy that way. So I've really developed the habit to notice that when it happens for too much or too long, even in a single day, and just like, I feel frustrated with myself, but in a really good way, like, <clears throat> like I take a deep breath and ask myself, what, what am I doing? Like, what's important to me? What truly excites me right now? How can I develop myself? How can I develop myself in alignment with who I am rather than just assuming the vibration of the consciousness that I'm part of at this planet or um, on this planet or even in a, like a social circumstance? Again, that's why free diving was really nice for me to sort of allow myself to fully go through the eye of the needle and really let go of all these social influences. But yeah, if we, if we learn to put that ultimatum on ourselves lovingly, not with judgment, but, but with great passion, then that builds a certain kind of a, a vibrancy, a, a fire that connects us to our spirit, to our soul, to our theme, to our purpose. And with that passion comes natural discipline to create what you wish to create that day or even just go where you want to go that day. It doesn't have to be super complicated. You don't have to become a, um, a rocket scientist. It's just about following that thread of excitement that is burning within you and paying attention to that. And if you learn to put that on yourself more and more or to, to hold yourself to that standard more and more again without judgment, just lovingly and passionately, then because you have that standard in your consciousness right now, you will notice everything that's nonsensical. So you develop that same single-mindedness without the need for a dangerous sport. Um, or, or a life-threatening situation. 
you can activate that now, but you have to care about where your life is going. You have to realize certain things such as, this is a short life, I came here for a reason, I'm not just a physical creature, I'm not the product of my mommy and daddy, I am a powerful being, I am on planet Earth, there's other civilizations, there's other themes going on, there's this global transformational age that is actually happening right now. How do I wish to be a part of that? How do I wish to contribute to that? Know first of all that you will have total capacity to be a part of that whole transformational thing. You can contribute to that. You can look around yourself and see, oh, someone put these tiles in place. Someone built this house. Someone designed how to build a house to begin with. Why do we build houses in square shapes? It doesn't make any sense. It felt, feels very jagged. It feels very, very harsh. It doesn't feel cozy at all. Why do we do that over and over and over again? Because someone started doing it because it's perhaps practical with certain materials, but we can expand beyond that now. And this is just one example, how we can look around ourselves and not be automatically assuming that that's the way life is. And that's, you know, we're capping ourselves when we're doing that. We're limiting ourselves. We have to see everything around us as being just one optional creation. And if you see something missing in the world, go create it. Go add it to that. Don't just say, oh, something is missing from the world. I'll just watch television, complain about it and go back to eating pizza. Do something about it if you're excited about it. Of course, if it doesn't excite you, don't do it. But if you see what's missing, design something, create something, innovate something, start a company or contact the right people or, or give suggestions to the right people so they know how to create something more um, fluently. Just an example. But vibrationally as well, we are always inundated with a collective vibration that we are a part of. And the less we are conscious of our own vibration in each moment, the more we sink into that baseline of the collective. That's why if we don't ask ourselves for too long, like what excites me? What do I want to do? What is really truly adventurous to me? What expands me? What aligns for me? If we don't ask that question for too long of a period of time, we will naturally have our frequency drop into the collective unconscious agreement of what's assumed to be reality. And then we're limiting ourselves. We're limiting our joy. We're limiting our sense of what's possible. We're limiting our sense of being alive. So we need to put that ultimatum on ourselves as if we're 100 feet below the surface of the ocean. Now, what is your most important thing in this moment? What's the most important inclination you have? What's the highest inspiration you have in this moment? What if the only thing that could save you or could bring you up vibrationally from 100 feet down and could save your life and have you breathe oxygen again? What if the only thing at 30 meters down, imagine that, being 30 meters below the water surface, looking up and seeing those tiny little people over there and having one breath to get there. What if the only thing that could get you up to the service was you being aware of what truly inspires you, what's important to you, and not making no concessions on that, letting no distractions come in when it comes to that. And then allow yourself to be elevated in that way because you are now creating your own frequency, choosing your own vibration, your own vibrational paradigm, rather than just letting the collective choose things for you or the people around you perhaps, or mommy and daddy in the back of your mind. So. You, you got to sift through that bullshit and get to the core of what's truly you, what's really important to you. 
if you manage to prioritize, you don't need any dangerous sport or, or life-threatening situation to get to that single-mindedness of clarity where you make no concessions on who you are. Even if, if it doesn't get you accepted into your communities, you don't care. You just don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Because if it does matter to you, you'll drown. You need to not be concerned with these things. And again, if you're 30 meters down below the surface of the sea, then you have to. You, ha you have no other option. You wouldn't be thinking, oh, what does you know, this person think of me? Or why don't they like me? No, you wouldn't. You would only think of your highest inspiration. If you apply that to everyday life, then you've got a golden ticket. You can do it anywhere, anytime. You can experience that single-mindedness, that purity, that oneness within yourself. That non, you know, non that no-nonsense policy, that no-nonsense energy, that no-nonsense state of clarity and consciousness. That's what many people seek because it feels great. It feels great, it feels fantastic, it feels whole, it feels complete. You feel simultaneously at peace, deeply at peace, because you know you're doing the right thing, because you know you're in alignment, and you're feeling simultaneously passionate, excited, and available to what's next and to what shows up as the most in alignment aspect of your life ready to act, ready, ready to engage, ready to create, to not be fooled, ready to bring in something new instead of mimic the old and assume it to be life as it is. Create something new. You know? <laughs> so epic. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> the, so this free diving thing really is a good analogy because and people can try this if they have a chance to go into the water even if you do it at say go to five meters or ten meters and maybe seek some guidance or do a beginner's course or whatever or even look up some videos and have a buddy there to support you but go go to that depth of five to ten meters if you're comfortable doing that equalize and then just stay there in a sense as long as you feel comfortable until you start feeling those <laughs> contractions and the urge to breathe and then like the only thing you can think of is going back to the surface but that's because you know the surface is only five meters above you but if the surface is 35 meters above you you can't even allow yourself to be I need to get up to the surface which is the only thing that happens at five meters is like oh I got to breathe but at 35 meters even that becomes irrelevant you're even more focused you're even more single-minded you can try this also just laying on your couch and holding your breath for as long as you can. And when the contractions uh, and the urge to breathe starts kicking in, hold it for another minute. It has nothing to do with your oxygen levels. It's only the buildup of CO2. Practically anyone, if they're in a relaxed state, can easily hold their breath for five minutes before passing out easily. But we don't because we get the CO2 buildup and we're not used to that discomfort and we start panicking. Uh, so it's one of the crucial aspects of freediving is to build that tolerance. But if you're laying on a couch, I'd say that generally no one would pass out. And even if you do laying on your bed, it's not a big deal. Because instantly you breathe as soon as you pass out and you get reoxygenated. It's not actually causing any brain damage. So, but try to get to the contractions. For most people, the contractions start around like between 30 and 60 seconds. But try to hold it one minute into that. So your body starts trying to breathe but you close your throat you just keep it closed and you just zone out like you just stay focused on nothing or whatever you want to pick but you just let you allow your body to ask for oxygen even though it doesn't need oxygen your blood is still uh, completely saturated after a minute it's still at like 97 96 percent um, and you only black out like around 50 percent 45 percent so and that goes real slow so Easily you can hold your breath for that long. It's just the contractions, but it's a really great experience to go through a couple of times to experience what it's like To negate the discomfort and to remain focused anyway To not care about anything else 